we pray these things in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Blaine, thank you so much for sharing your testimony. I'm so pumped about this new series that we are in, that we're just starting. I'm so excited about Christmas. I'll tell you what, I walked in this morning, and the Christmas tree was up, all the decorations around Waterline. It is Christmas at Waterline for sure. It looks gorgeous in here. We got stuff. I don't know what you call this stuff, but it's on the stage. It's beautiful. It's pretty. It's lit up. It's so nice. And uh, I don't know how many of you are ready for Christmas. You got the tree up. You got lights on the house. You got stuff going. Danielle put a little lights yesterday on the house just to get started. But man, it's been a crazy uh, week, month for my family. And can I just, just share it with you? Because I know that there's some people here realizing it's 24 days until Christmas. 24 days as of today till Christmas. And I can't wait. I'm excited. Christmas is one of my favorite times of year. And many of you have our, like your planners and you've got it all put together and you're ready to go and great, wonderful. At the Freed House, it's a little bit different than what we had planned. I'm a planner, okay? I like to strategize. I like to know what's happening. Find a lot of hope in it. Find a lot of peace in it, really. I like to know what's coming and what's ahead of me. I could not have expected what was going to happen this past couple of weeks in my house. So here's how the plan was supposed to work out. Um, I was supposed, we were going to, we've been saving up for a long time for new flooring in our house. And so uh, we got the new flooring, we're ready to go, and I started in on the project, which I spread out for like three weeks. It was going to take a long time. And the first week I was going to take all the furniture, you know what I mean, all the, everything, and move it all out to the garage. Had some friends come help me. So now all that's in the house is like two couches and a TV. We got kids, we got to have a TV, okay? So we got two couches and a TV, and it's just, it's disrupted. You ever have a house like that, just disrupted, like nothing is in the right place? Everything's gone, can't find anything. Well, then the next week, I take out the carpet, all right? And uh, so I rip up all the carpet, all the padding, and now it's just concrete, two couches and a, and, uh, and a, and a TV, all right? Because we got kids, so we got to have a TV. So no carpet. We can live with no carpet. We got, you know, just, just tools everywhere, and, and then we paint. I don't know if you've painted before. It's awful. Uh, and so we got paint. And it doesn't match. And then we got to paint the whole wall because it doesn't match. You know, it's just like, like we got to change wall colors now. It's just become this project. And, and we were going well. We were, the Freed House was kind of in order and, and we were kind of hold down knowing that this was going to be for a short season. The plan was get the flooring in Thanksgiving week. My dad had the work, week off work. He's going to come help me install it because uh, I'm not very handy. Uh, I do know which end of the hammer to hit with, but that's about where it ends, Okay. Uh, and so he was going to come help me install it. My brother Joseph from Indianapolis, he came up. He was going to help me. And the, the whole world was kind of in disorder, but we were holding it all together. And we knew that it was just for a short period. And then, and then about two weeks ago, Danielle got this migraine. Uh, you may not know a lot about my, my, my wife's medical history, and I won't go into detail about it. But I'll just say she got a whole team of doctors. Her immunologist, she's got a neurologist. ENT. I mean, she's got a whole team of people and her keeping her afloat. And uh, my, my wife is my best friend. And so when she's hurting, uh, the whole house hurts, right? Like, like just nothing's right. And, um, and so she gets this headache and she's not one to get migraines like this. And this, it just it got worse and worse. And as the pressure changed, it just got worse to where it was agonizing. And this past Monday, as I'm putting my thoughts together for us, and this, Danielle calls me, and she's in such pain and such agony. you got to come home. And she had, we had gotten an MRI before, just trying to find out where is this pain coming from. And it was debilitating. And you know how it goes. When mama's not happy, ain't nobody happy. And when mama's in pain, and it's supposed to be Christmas time, we're trying to get through Thanksgiving. And in the midst of trying to install this flooring, my wife's trying to just hold it together. Well, we go to the hospital for migraines. Have you ever been to a hospital for migraines? They give you drugs. Not like a pill, like, like an infusion of drugs. And, and we had no idea. Danielle drove to St. Vincent right up here. I met her there with my car. And uh, they said, okay, you're not going to be able to drive for the next four days. You're going to feel dizzy and tired, and this stuff's going to wipe you out. It's like resetting your brain. And Danielle, uh, we weren't planning on it. We got plans. Like, it's Christmas uh, we're both pastors, like this is not how it's supposed to go. Like we were going to get the flooring in, Christmas decorations. My car sat at St. Vincent for a week because I didn't know, we didn't have any clue that this was going to wipe her out, that this was going to be so much. 
talk about pain. Talk about change of plans. There's been change of plans in many people's lives. And whenever God changes our plans or whenever life changes our plans, it can really rattle our faith. And sometimes we can go into Christmas and go, what is going on? Like, how is this possible, God? Where is God when all this pain and all this turmoil? I'll tell you right now, at the Freed House, there's no decorations. There's no tree. There's no tinsel. There's no sign of Christmas. We're just trying to get the furniture back into the house. Thank God my brother came, helped us move the stuff back in. We got couches and furniture. We still got the TV, of course. But we, you know, just get life back together. But not Christmas. We're not ready for Christmas. Our plans have changed, and my wife has been in pain and, and suffering, and my best friend. So I come to you today very real about this subject, if I can be. That sometimes our plans can change, and we can have our faith rattled. But God is a God that we can trust. And you might be sitting there going, John, that's easy for you to say you're the pastor. You think about those things. And I'm telling you, you know, it is easy for me to talk about that. And one of the reasons why Waterline goes all out for Christmas and why you have these invitations on your chair, one for you, two for other people, is because we want to help you experience a Christmas you never thought possible before. I think miracles happen during Christmas. I really do. It's because people are very aware that there's something supernatural, something magical that can happen, something that we can all experience, that God is with us. And we want to invite people into that. And next week, we're going to have this stage full of cute little kids. It's going to be awesome. And they're going to be singing, and we're going to be celebrating for them, all right? We're going to be clapping like this is America's Got Talent, and they got talent, okay? It's going to be awesome. We're going to be having a great time. And they're going to do a little rehearsal today. It's going to be wonderful. I want you to be here with us. But I know that there's somebody else in your life who's just maybe like me, who their plans have changed, and something is happening that is beyond them, but they really need to trust God in it. And they really need to know where God is and who God is in it. It's easy for me to say that, isn't it? But I want to take a look at the character of Mary in the Christmas story. Now, now what, this is what I do. When it comes into Christmas, for me to get into the Christmas season, I like to find different characters in the Christmas story. And sometimes I can identify with the shepherds. Sometimes I come into Christmas and identify with the magi. Sometimes I come into Christmas and I identify with, with Joseph. But this morning, I want to take you into the life of Mary Look at the Christmas story from, from her perspective and how God showed up when all of her plans were changed. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Dr. Luke tells us the story of Christmas and the story of Jesus coming to this world to be the Savior of the world in the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And, it's, and I'll tell you right now, before we start reading it, you're not going to find this perfect Christmas card photo with the perfect everything in place and everybody's happy, and it's just kind of glittery. It's not that way. It's real life. So if you come from real life, welcome. This is a real Christmas, and God is with us in a real Christmas. And it says this. Now watch how he says it, how Luke says it. In the sixth month, all the calendar, all the days, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, which is Mary's cousin, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, Galilee to a virgin named Mary. Imagine God of all creation, God who controls everything, God who controls armies and weather and all this stuff. He narrows his focus of the whole universe to earth to this little podunk, small little town in backwoods, Nazareth, to this little village in Galilee, to a little girl in a place where there's no running water, there's no electricity to a little teenage girl, Jewish girl named Mary. He, he turns his faith toward her, and he rests the entire fate of the world on this little girl's shoulders. Luke goes on, he says, she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. So here's her life. She's in this moment, ready to be married, and, and Gabriel appeared to her and said, listen, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. 
You know, we don't know much about Mary. We don't know her parents. We don't know her aunts and uncles. We don't know her backstory. We don't know the things that she loved to do or the dreams that she had. What we know is one character referenced by God, that this is a favored woman, that God has looked at her. He has seen her. He's taken note of her. I, I can just imagine then that, that Mary loves to worship, and she worships God with passion, like, like just in every part of her body. She loves God. She knows who God is. And she knows who he's about. He knows, he knows, she knows these stories about God. She's heard about this God who shows up and does incredible things. And now Mary knows that God knows her. And all those prayers that she had just written from the bottom of her soul, now God says, I know you. I have a purpose for you. I have a plan for you. Obviously, verse 29 confused and disturbed, which is how I basically spend most of my life, especially this past week, has been very confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Like, I'm trying to process this. I'm trying to get this to fit within the category of my world and my life. Don't be afraid, Mary. Well, that's their natural reaction. I'll be honest with you. It's like, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to get through this? And how are we going to make it this week? Danielle called me on Monday, and she's crying, and she's in excruciating pain. And I know she's at home lying on the couch. The kids are at school. She can't even get up off the couch. She's so much in pain. And I said, babe, I, I got to write a sermon on suffering right now. I can't really be taking these calls. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that to her. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> get your coat. We're leaving. No. No, I, I went home to her, and I was like, what, how are we going to get through this? And don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found, listen to me, you have found favor with God. You found favor with God. God heard her, heard her prayers, knows her heart, knows her innermost thoughts, has put her together and created her. And, and, and when God shows up and says, I love who you are, don't be afraid. I love who you are. And this Christmas, I want you to hear that too. I just want you to know that God is with you. And he's not with you to judge you or anything like that. But God is with you going, I found favor with you. I love you. It's why you're still breathing. Because he still has a purpose for you. He still has a purpose for you. It's why you're still here. It's why you're here at this Christmas right now surrounded by those people at this time in this place in this podunk little tiny town indiana backwoods god has favor and a purpose for you even in the midst of change plans even in the midst of your pain and even in the midst of your suffering well he goes on and he gives her the purpose now you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him jesus and he will be very great and will be called the son of the most high and the lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. He's going into all the details about how great and how big God is. And Mary interrupts, time out. How can this happen? I am a virgin. This is not scientific. How is this going to work out? If you're like me, when it comes to your plans being changed, you're trying to put things in categories, put things in boxes. I'm trying to wrap my mind around this, and fear is building, faith is dwindling, and you start going, okay, God, what are you doing? What's happening here? This scientifically cannot even work out. I'm not going to get into the birds and the bees with you, God, but this is not how it works. And, and the Gabriel, he responds, the angel replied, now watch this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the son of god and what's more your relative elizabeth has become pregnant in old age people used to say she was barren but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month for the word of god will never fail love never fails or in some manuscripts it says for nothing is impossible with god nothing is impossible with god and as mary is just kind of broadsided, overcome, overwhelmed by this news that you're going to conceive and give 
birth, all of her plans that she has ever made are now slowly trickling out the door. I mean, think about it for a minute. Mary has plans. She was ready to get married to Joseph. They had met the love story, the flirting, him noticing her and her noticing him. This romance that is now, what's going to happen? What's going to happen when I have to go to Joseph and go, guess what? I'm pregnant. It's God. It's going to think you're crazy. Uh, and the fear then and the insecurity and the, how is this? They were going to build a home together. He's a carpenter. They were going to build a home. They were going to buy a dog together. They were going to travel. They were going to grow the business. They were going to attempt things on Pinterest and fail miserably together. <laughs> she had plans. And someday, in the future, someday, she'd have a baby. A boy or a girl, but not like this. Now Mary is suffering. Her plans are changed, her faith is rattled, and she has this season of suffering. That's going to be nine months of just awkward explanations while she's, her belly's getting bigger. And, and we don't hear about Mary's mom or dad or how they may have brought the subject up or how they explained it to their, grand, to their parents or, or anything like this. And this is a small town. Things that happen in small towns, rumors get started. People remember things. People bring up things. How is this going to go? What's going to happen? Where am I to be? Rumors. The awkwardness and the pain of explaining this to Joseph and feeling like a failure. The feeling of being pregnant and alone. And how fear just continues to grow and grow and grow. The gossip and the hurtful things people will say or accuse. This is now Mary's life. This is not the Christmas that she had planned. But I have to take note to verse 38. Mary responded. In the midst of her plans being changed, Mary responded in a way that I hope I can respond when my plans are changed. When I'm going through a a season of suffering and pain. She says, I am the Lord's servant. I love that. Like, she leans in on who God is. She leans in on who God has been in the past and who God will be in the future. She doesn't ask the questions over what or how or where or when. She just rests and she leans in on who God is. I can't explain it. I can't bottle it up. I can't put it into a nice little package. I can't share it with you in other ways than this. I am the Lord. I am the Lord's servant. And may everything you've said about me come true. Because I don't know how it's going to happen. But may everything you say come true. I trust you in the midst of this pain and suffering. And then the angel left her. I'm captured by the story of Mary this week. I'm captured by the story of Christmas this week when it comes to this Mary because in the midst of her suffering, she leans back on who God has been. And so I have to believe that the verse in Proverbs that I've clung to is something that she's clinging to, that she clung with all she was and who she was to who God is and who God wanted to be in her life, what God wanted to do could not be explained, but who God wanted to be in her life, she could trust. She had to cling to Proverbs. Look at Proverbs. The verse says, May, you can make plans, and we all have plans, but the Lord's purposes will prevail. She has to believe that God's purposes will prevail, that he is in control. That's who he is. You can make plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. prevail. And then Isaiah capturing the words of God as he writes it down. When he says, don't be afraid, God says, 
Don't be afraid, God says, because he knows you're going to be fearful. He knows that fear is going to rush in when faith rushes out, when all the plans that you had come tumbling down, and all the plans and strategies and places where you wanted to do and things you wanted to be and all this stuff doesn't work out. It's natural to be afraid. So God says through Isaiah, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Man, I'm clinging to that myself this morning. I'm with you. This is the verse I held on to this week. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. That's who he is. He doesn't promise to tell us what he's going to do or how he's going to do it, but he promises to tell us that he will be with us. That's who he is. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. I know some of your stories. As a pastor, you share them with me, and I pray for you. And so I know. But there's some of your stories I don't know. We get all kinds of guests that come to Waterline or people who kind of hold their cards kind of close. So I realize that I don't know all your stories, but I know that there's a person here today who didn't plan to be job hunting like this. I know that there's people here today who didn't plan to be separated this Christmas. There's people today who are wrestling and working through and suffering through medical issues greater than Danielle's, greater than our family's. And you're trying to come up with answers. And I know that there are people here today who at Christmas time will have an empty chair at the table when last year that chair wasn't empty and the pain and the sorrow and how are we going to even make Christmas normal when it will never be normal again. And I know there are people who are coming into Christmas just trying to figure out how they're going to get gifts under the tree and pay the heat bill and put food in the refrigerator. I get it. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God is with you. God is with you. And God has a purpose for you. And oftentimes, God's purposes for our life come with two edges. Great joy and great pain. And maybe no one has ever had the guts to just tell you that. But can I tell you that? A lot of times, God's purposes for us come with great pain and great joy. That's life. And that's God moving and working in life. I remember Christmases long time ago, Danielle graduating from college. She took an extra semester in school, and she graduated the Christmas season. See, the story about Danielle, my wife, is she knew that she was called to be a pastor and to be in ministry. But that got worked out, and that got figured out in college as she was forking out money and taking on student debt and getting this degree in special education. Oh, she's great with kids. That's why she's good with me. It's the only reason we could be married. She's just great with special kids. Me. And for years, she would study special education. And there's so much of Danielle's story that, that God has kind of put this and propelled her and brought her up to study special education. She had gone through all the classes. Now she was student teaching, just finishing up this degree, almost coming to the tail end. She's working with a young girl in the school to count pennies, nickels, and dimes. This little girl, she understood, would never, never get nickels and dimes and pennies. But Danielle was going to work with her and work with her and work with her. And as she's working with this young lady over her shoulder, she saw the playground out there. And she thought to herself, I just love anything to take this little girl out there and invest in her and tell her about Jesus and tell her how much God has a purpose and a plan for her life. Not nickels, dimes, and quarters, but so much more than that. And she made a very difficult decision. I was there when she made the decision to change her degree while she was almost done and start taking on as many ministry courses as she possibly could, even taking on an extra semester of school so that she could study ministry, knowing what God's purpose was for her life. No, it, it changed the plans. It changed the plans. But I watched my wife walk through that, trusting that God had a purpose for her life, even when life's plans changed, even when there was pain in that, God had a purpose. God had a purpose. I look at the way my wife is a pastor today, and I think, man, God had a purpose and a plan. But then I look at the way that my wife loves our boy Dean with all his special needs, and I say, man, wow, God, you had a purpose. You had a purpose. 
And while it comes with great joy, it also comes with great pain. And some of you find yourself in that place of pain. I'm with you. I'm with you this morning. God is with you. Listen to this. Sometimes God's greatest invitations feel like our worst interruptions. I read that and it just popped off the page. I wanted to share it with you. Sometimes God's greatest invitations feel like our worst interruptions. For Mary, there was no midwife, there was no mother or sister to help her. No, there was this hairy, callous carpenter dude, right? He didn't know what he was doing. He's not gentle, and she's just this fragile, teenage little Jewish girl, and here he is, burly like the ogre. You know what I mean? Like, what is he going to do for her? And that's all she had. How does this make any sense? Here they are in this dugout hole on the side of a hill called a stable with nothing but livestock and itchy straw and, and hay and animals. And, and here she holds her naked baby. And she doesn't have a blanket that was made by an aunt or a friend or a gift received at a baby shower. She didn't get any of that. No, that wasn't in... That was in the plans, but it's not in this purpose. And now she holds this baby, and, and they wrap him in all they had, swaddling clothes, swaddling cloth, the same kind of thing you'd use for a burial. It was so foretelling of the purpose that God had. But her, in that moment, she couldn't see that future. She only could trust who God was. Trust in who God was going to be in her life. I am the Lord, was Mary's prayer. I belong to him. He is with me. I am the Lord's. You see, God came to be with us. God, in the form of a small fertilized egg, divided and redivided over and over, building over nine months into a baby, Jesus the Savior of the world was born a small baby. God, who created everything, couldn't communicate, walk, or see further than 12 inches at birth. This, in my mind, is unimaginable. The creator of the earth of universe who controls all things. Jesus came to be with us, not in perfection Christmas card all put together decorated but to a real world with real pain and real problems and real fear and real doubts and real struggles and real suffering and real pain to be your real Savior. And if you're like me and you've had a real bad week and you're not really sure what kind of real Christmas this is going to be, you can know that a real God came into that midst. A real Jesus was born to that kind of realness. And you can be real with him because God is with you. He's not sheltering himself from your pain. He's already gone through it with you. God has already gone through everything your life will ever experience in pain and suffering. Christ himself has gone through it for you so that you could know who he is. On days like today, you could sit in church and go, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. But I am the Lord's and I'm going to lean in. On who God is, not who I am, but on his purpose, on his plans, and his purposes will always, always, always prevail, always prevail. Even at Christmas 2018, he will prevail. What if, what if, Waterline, your interruptions were actually an invitation to surrender to his power and his peace? and his provision, and his purpose for your life. What if? See, if Mary were here today, oh, you know she'd be a sassy little lady, don't you? The things that she has gone through and the things that she has seen and who God has told her that she was, she would not be quiet. Uh-uh. No, she would stand up here with you today and she would tell you this truth right here. Listen to me and write this down because we're going to share it with somebody this week. And I need to share it with you because it comes from my heart. 
This is what Mary tells us at Christmas. This is what the story of Mary and the prayer of Mary and the response of Mary, Mary tells us this Christmas. Right here, right here. That the more she surrendered to the Lord and his purpose, the more she realized she was surrounded by God's purpose. The more she surrendered, the more she realized that she was surrounded by God. Oh, we hear that in the story of Blaine. The more he surrendered to who God was and surrendered his life to him, the more he sees that he is surrounded by Christ. He is surrounded by God's purpose for him. He is sur- his home is surrounded. His marriage is surrounded. His boys and his children are surrounded. His work life is surrounded. Mary would tell us, the more you surrender, the more you're surrounded. So surrender, respond. I am the Lord's servant. I'm here for you, God. God to be greater, I to be less. Who who said that? John the Baptist. Who is John the Baptist, mama? Elizabeth. Who is Elizabeth's cousin? Mary. And where did John the Baptist learn it? Mary. Yeah. And your life, the pain and the suffering and the craziness that you are going through right now will become the template for your testimony. It'll change somebody's life. Dallas Willard, one of my favorite theologians, he tells this story about a little boy. It was the story that spoke to my heart this week. This little little boy, his mom had passed away, died. In fact, Dallas Willard's mom had died when he was a very young boy. So this little boy lost his mom, and he felt overwhelmed with grief and sadness, especially at night. He was overcome with loneliness. I cannot even begin to imagine it. And the story goes on that he would come into his father's room and ask if he could sleep with him. But even then, being there next to his father and in that warm bed there, safe, even then he could not rest. He could not find peace. Not until he knew that not only was he was with his father, but that his father's face was turned toward him. So there in the dark, he would ask his father, will you turn your face toward me? And with his eyes closed, searching for rest, when the fear would come on, when the loneliness would come on, he would say, Father, is your face turned toward me now? Is your face turned toward me now? Yes, his father would respond. You're not alone. I'm with you. And my face is turned toward you. And when at last he was assured of this, he could rest. And this Christmas, many of us find ourselves in the midst of changed plans. When our plans are changed, suffering can rattle our faith. And this Christmas, 2018, be merry. Cling to who God has been and who God has promised to be in your life. Believe and know that God has a purpose for your life. Christmas is your invitation to have peace, having assurance that God's face is turned toward you. Don't be afraid. God says, I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. I want to invite you into a journey this Christmas. Find yourself in the scriptures and allow God to speak to you through the Bible and what God has for you. I believe that God and the Holy Spirit wants to speak to your life this week. As you go into Christmas, for me, I'll be reading this scripture as I'm putting up my Christmas tree, hanging my first Christmas bulb putting up lights, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to my heart, give peace to my mind, and remind me of who my God is. Through Mary's story, through the Christmas story. Call it cheesy, but I'm kind of having a cheesy week. So I wrote a prayer for you called my Merry Christmas Prayer. You like this? Merry Christmas? Got that? It's a dad joke. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Maybe you'll remember it 
So here's my Merry Christmas prayer for all of us, including myself. It says, Lord Jesus, this Christmas, please help me. See that you are with me and that I don't need to be afraid. Show me how I can find peace in you, even in the midst of my suffering. And finally, Father, help me to believe that you are holding me up with your victorious right hand. Would you stand with me? I get it. Some of you come in here this morning and you've had one of those seasons. I'm with you. But God is with you. God is with us. We can come into this place and find hope and peace and confidence. And we're going to bring more people into this place. We're going to fill this place full of people who are in pain and suffering and saying, where is God at Christmas? You can say, we don't know where he's at, but we know who he is. He's with us. He's with us right here in the midst of our life, in the midst of our pain and suffering. He doesn't hold back. He's right here with us. And I'm going to pray for you. I want to pray blessing over your family, over your Christmas season. But as I pray for you, will you do me a favor? Would you be praying for somebody else who's not here yet? Would you be putting somebody on your heart and on your mind, someone who else needs peace this Christmas? They need to know who God is. And they need to know that God is with them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your church comes together this morning, and my attention right now is turned towards the people in this room, the people listening online, watching online. God, I pray blessing for these people. I pray that your face would be upon them in the midst of their pain and suffering, as you have promised us throughout Scripture that you are the God who is with us. Emmanuel, God with us, is the announcement at Christmas. This Christmas, God, I know that there are people just like Danielle and I who come into this house today, and we need to know who God is. We need to worship the God, the living God, who is right here with us. I pray blessing and favor on their marriages, on their children, on their homes, around their dinner tables. I pray blessings around that Christmas tree. I pray blessings at that front door and the people that will come in and the people that will go out. I pray blessings, God, in each one of those dark places in that home at night when loneliness or fear can creep in. They would know that your face is toward them. I join them, God, right now in their prayers for the people in their life who don't yet know you. That this Christmas, God, that this church would be that lighthouse, that port in the storm, where they can come in and experience the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, born in a manger, born into suffering and pain, didn't hold himself back, but came and stepped right into our pain and suffering. Emmanuel, God with us. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. Let's stay standing. Let's sing to the Lord.